Good morning, everyone. We'll get started. Councillor, uh, the chair, uh, Councillor Egloy, is uh, at uh, a meeting uh, regarding disaster relief in his uh, in his uh, ward. So I'm going to begin the meeting this morning. I just found out, so bear with me. So we'll start through here. We've got. Um, Oh, thank you. I don't mind being Keith. <laughs> Always thinking this guy. So our first item uh, this morning is uh, an item from Councilor Leeper, the interactive mapping tools, identifying opportunity to improve cycling infrastructure connectivity. I believe that, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Declarations of interest. I guess I should have asked that. And confirmation of minutes? Okay, Kerry. Okay. Um, so I believe Councillor Leeper has got a presentation for us and uh, Bike Ottawa is here to have it. Excellent. So we'll hold that. Uh, the second is a front ending agreement for cycling infrastructure within the Booth Street right of way between the Ottawa River pathway and Fleet Street. This is a, a good news story where we're going to get uh, um, some cycling infrastructure through a, a development. So, any questions? Mm -hmm. Carried. Excellent. And number three, status update, transportation committee inquiries and motions for the period ending. I have a question for that. Do you? Yeah. Is it quick? It's very quick. Okay, ask it now. So, uh, there, there are two items there. One which is uh, relating to uh, the parking authority review. I, I thought that uh, when, when we came to committee with that review that we would have a better indication ahead of governance uh, for next term. So what I'm seeing now is the date seems to have slipped to uh, third quarter of 2019, which I'm concerned with because I think it brings us too far into the next term. I, I'd like the review to begin as part of uh, governance. I don't know why we're not finding ourselves in Q1 of 2019 or even Q3 or Q4 of 2018, but rather in late 2019. So I don't know if there's someone from, I guess it's Mr. Wiley's shop? That's correct. That's uh, with Mr. Wiley. So it's, I don't know how to do it, Madam, Madam Chair, if uh, we're, uh, if it could, I, I, it's just that date seemed to have slipped now and the staff have rec recommended a new date, which I am not comfortable with. Well, there's no one to answer that right now. Maybe we will hold it and try to get someone down with that. Uh, yeah, and then the second one relates to uh, an inquiry about uh, the snow review, especially near school zones, the removal of snow near school zones. And it refers to an existing review that doesn't, doesn't provide with timelines of the implementation of that review. So. I, I, I'm okay with waiting for that review to be completed, but because there's no timeline on that review, it leaves no timeline for what we're asking of. So, again, I, I, I don't want time to slip here and, and us to forget what the intent of those, uh, those directions were. So, wondering if we could have a set date as to when that review will be completed. I believe that would be the same staff person. So, we'll, um, We'll ask uh, Mr. Wiley to come down or somebody from the staff to respond to both of those. So we'll, we'll just hold number three for a quick response to, uh, to those two. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, we have um, uh, IPD, the uh, Barhaven uh, Light Rail Transit. I believe that uh, Councilor Deans is going to move that motion to lift it. And thank you, Madam Chair. That pursuant to subsection 89.3 of Procedure Bylaw 2016-377, the Transportation Committee approved the rules of procedure be read to allow for consideration of the item listed as IPDA Barhaven Light Rail Transit Baseline Station to Barhaven Town Center Planning and Environmental Assessment Study Statement of Work. So on waiver? Okay. So we'll come back to that. And I will, so back to the beginning, turn it over to Councillor Leeper. 
Thanks, Chair, and thanks to the uh, committee for their indulgence as I bring uh, a piece of research or a, a tool that I funded out of my office budget to map uh, bicycle routes in the city uh, to this committee. Just for your information, uh, so you have an understanding of uh, the work that Bike Ottawa has done, uh, and I hope that it will intrigue you enough to get in touch with them to find out more. Uh, Chair, what I'd like to do is just turn it over to uh, the delegation for the, uh, for the presentation. I've got a few comments after questions. Okay, and it's uh, Heather Shearer from Bike Ottawa. Welcome, Heather. Hi, thank you very much. I brought you a slideshow today, so I'm hoping we can get that up on the screen. I uh, don't know if I have control here. So I'd like to introduce to you the map that our data group put together. This is a group of volunteers. Uh, many of them do this kind of work professionally, but a lot of us are just very interested citizens. So thank you to the City of Ottawa for providing the open data that really formed the foundation for making this possible. So for us, mapping is, uh, so it looks like this is a bit of a, a power, not so much a PowerPoint, but we're going to scroll down. So it's, it's not just about where you can go, but for a bike cyclist, it's really where you'd want to go because traffic stress is really one of the deciding factors in whether or not a route is comfortable enough to bicycle on. And what is traffic stress? We all intuitively have a pretty good understanding of that. So if you can see, there's one person here on probably the world's most protected bike lane, the McKenzie Cycle Track. That's a low level of stress, runs in front of the U.S. Embassy. On the other hand, uh, there's another fellow crossing in front along Rideau. And that's a very high traffic stress environment because it's high traffic. There's a lot of um, volume, speed of traffic, uh, no separation from cars. So we, we took basically three easy steps to making a map. And I apologize to the data group for oversimplifying, but basically the first step, document it. And what we mean by that is we just went out into the community and took a lot of photos. We put a grid over the city of Ottawa. This shows approximately the kind of coverage we have from 0% uh, to 100% of the streets covered with photography. Uh, over the course of the summer last year, we took some 450,000 images and covered 2,000 new kilometers of street. Uh, and that was uh, decided by Mapillary. This is the program that we used as being one of the most successful community initiatives in their history. Uh, so you can see when we started this project, we didn't have a lot of coverage in June of 2017. By October, we have been all over the city. What that looks like on the screen is uh, you, can, you can see there there's a representation of where each photo is. And if you click on the lower left, you can bring up a street view-like image. And there's a lot of data in an image like this. You can see a stop sign. You can see a wayfinding sign. You can see that there's a fence in front of the river. Even on the bridge overhead there, you can see there's a light and a speed limit sign. And that's all data that can be entered into a map based on that photograph. That can be entered by users. And also, the computer software itself is smart enough to recognize a lot of common things like signs. So yield signs, stop signs are highlighted here. And I can assist mappers in labeling the map, which is our next step. So the city of Ottawa already has a lot of open source data that found from the foundation. We just continue to add to that by adding additional labels to the map. So is there a bike lane or not? Is there parking or not? Uh, what is the speed limit when it wasn't complete data? So we continue to complete the data that the city of Ottawa had already started. But just going in, and it's just like uh, anything else, if you've got a photo, point, click, add a label. And from there, the next step is to sort it. So sorting all of these pieces of streets is what really allowed us to assign a level of traffic stress. And we sorted based on a logic that was developed by the Mineta Institute. So first of all, are you separated from traffic or not? Sort into two bins. And then from there, there are other yes, no questions. What's, uh, is there a bike lane at all? Yes or no. What is the speed limit or range? What class of roadway is this? Is there parking? And based on all those categorizations, we were able to assign a level of traffic stress from one to four to each segment of road and pathway in the city of Ottawa. And it looks like this when you look on the screen. You can even check out our photographs embedded in the map and provide commentary if you think something has been mislabeled. So you can continue improving the map as people use it, which is really the next step. So our maps are available on maps.bikeottawa.ca. And we've gotten fantastic feedback. It looks like this. Uh, so we've got four different maps. The base is the stress map. But from that, you can do routing A to B, point and click. Where would you like to start? Where would you like to finish? And what level of traffic stress are you willing to tolerate? Ideally, you get a fairly direct route, but if not, that shows you that there's a missing link. If you're being routed 
far out of your way to avoid a high-stress situation. And people have told us this has helped them find the granularity in the network and be able to find that, that permeability that they didn't even, they weren't even aware that there might be a cut through here or that fence or that you could use this quieter street instead of that major arterial. And so we've gotten great feedback from the community from this. Uh, it's also useful from a single point. You can see how far can you travel within a certain level of traffic stress in a certain amount of time. And finally, we've had a, another uh, a map based on the city of Ottawa's collision data that's also available on our website. So the outcomes of this project have been multi, uh, multiple outcomes. So we've got a photo resource that anyone can use to plan their trips. You can preview turns uh, that we could use in cycling advocacy ourselves. So in the middle of winter, we can have photos of bike paths that we didn't anticipate needing, but they're available now. Uh, and likewise, other mappers can draw on these photos if they may be mapping for other reasons, looking for is there a bench, is there a ramp into a business for accessibility purposes. This is something else that we can continue to add uh, richness to the OpenStreetMap data set. Uh, the wayfinding is something that we have improved as we've been improving the map. We are continuing to improve the data. And anyone can contribute to improving that data by providing us feedback through our maps. And so that we've had a number of those uh, comments, and our, our mapping team is continuing to improve the map. Uh, and it's a resource that we can use in advocacy for identifying missing links. And like I mentioned, the community has been finding it really useful as a, uh, a mapping tool for planning trips. So thank you. Thank you. That's the uh, second or third time I think I've seen this uh, presentation. And I've, uh, I've been on the, uh, the tool. And uh, even though I've cycled around the city or um, parts of it, uh, for years, I find it so helpful just to understand how fast I'll get somewhere, what level of stress that will mean, am I willing to take Carling Avenue, or you know, is there another way of, of getting to where I want to go? But it also uh, encourages people who uh, won't cycle otherwise uh, to, to you know to get onto a pathway or to get onto uh, a street where there is a low level of stress where you actually can you know take your kids who are maybe seven and eight out onto a, a quiet neighborhood street and uh, and move about. So as we're building our cycling infrastructure and getting uh, getting more into place, that granularity, like you say, in terms of uh, where we can get around to to do our you know daily kind of chores and and move about is uh, is really uh, exciting with this with this tool. So thank you. Um, so questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Councillor Harder. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I think that uh, you know we're doing a good job in investing in uh, cycling opportunities, but I think if when you're going to put it over the edge, so for example, the number of people that will ever be able to cycle all the way to work from Barhaven is limited based on really your lifestyle um, and whether you have the time to do it and you're competent enough to do it. But however, what the real wins are in a community of 90,000 people are to have people cycling more within it. And so I think that there's opportunities from looking at that that you can say, you know what, if we were to tweak it and do this or make this a little bit better, uh, it would be safer and I think that we would see um, more people cycling. So I really, I really like this. And uh, how are you going to market it? Like, what's the plan? Do you know that or is that a Councillor Leeper? Well, I can start. Thank you, Councillor Harder, because I, I live near Barhaven, and it really is nice to be able to cycle in the community area along Strandhood, for example. There's a new cycle track that many people may not be aware they can go from their neighborhood to the stores. Uh, but just on that, you know, a lot of people say, well, why are you, building, why are you investing $80 million plus on Strandhurd, the one-third to one-quarter of the entire road that's a two-lane rural road with ditches? Because you, there are no cycling opportunities there. There, no, are, are, there are no pedestrians right now. So having that expenditure for the overpass and all of that, the turn lanes and all that, includes a cycling structure that we don't have now, and, and certainly for pedestrians as well. So thank you for... Yeah, yeah and I'm, I'm often bragging about Barhaven. It's actually very bike-friendly. <laughs> I'm actually often bragging about Barhaven, but it's actually quite bike-friendly within the community. Uh, yeah, so for promotion, as you asked, uh, we are promoting it on our website, so we're taking advantage of media opportunities to make sure people are aware of it. And we've actually heard from the Bike to Work Month campaign that they've used it in their education materials to tell people how to plan a trip. So it's, it's really been getting good uptake in the community. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Councillor Harvey. I think it is important to remind people that uh, you can cycle around Barhaven. There's been a lot that's been done in that uh, in that part of the city. You know, we often I think the the public perception is often that it all happens in the downtown, but it, the, we have good cycling infrastructure in other parts of the city. So just I'll give you an example. I have a very old park that was just redone called Green Bank Park. It had the original water structure. You know, the one across from the Barhaven Mall. So I had, so it's just been completed, and I had somebody say, how come there isn't a bike rack there, right? And so and this was just last week, and so the, the park owner said, well, usually those little kids who would park would bike to that park because it's a smaller park, and they just tend to drop their bikes. But I did find out the cost, and I'm considering whether or not that's something that I would fund out of my CILs. It's $3,000, apparently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tomashenko? Yes, thanks, uh, Heather. As you know, it's my second time through. I was at the Bike Auto AGM the other night, but given that we're in the middle of a C word that we shouldn't mention here, um, I had to dash off just before you uh, just before you finished. So uh, thanks for that. Um, like Councillor Harder, um, what's interesting is that um, well, I guess there's two things that I see a particular value to this tool. Um, one is it tells people um, here is a better, safer, more reassuring route to take, or possibly if there isn't one and at your comfort level, please don't do this. You may be at risk or find yourself in a very uncomfortable situation. That can be useful. Um, but um, probably the most important day for us uh, and our staff is why is there not a comfortable route to get from here to there? Where, where is the problem? What is the pinch point? Uh, and so there I think that's particularly useful to us in giving clear direction, this is what we have to deal with. I know for me, it, it's going to be the Bank Street Bridge over the Rio Canal and, and Billings Bridge uh, over, over the Rideau River, um, likely until those bridges are, are rebuilt, just because of the physical infrastructure that, that they are. Um, but even to know that, and that so many people are telling us, wow, I could be taking, I want to be taking this ride, but for that problem, gives a higher, uh, a higher priority to it, um, uh, which is great. But also to, to Councillor Hardware's point is that um, within communities, not everyone as you say. Um, we often hear almost as a um sometimes we hear it as a criticism for why is the city spending a lot of money on cycling infrastructure because we are never going to ride downtown anyway, and my response is regularly, I'm not expecting you to ride downtown from Barhaven. That isn't necessarily the point. Uh, and in fact, maybe the point is with this map, there's a great way to get to the, I know that item is coming, the new LRT station in Barhaven, <laughs> at which point you can either put your bike on, you know, on the train or, or leave it and, and come from there. So really just some comments and, uh, and thanks for doing this work. I think it's a great example of, of citizen science, of citizen data. Uh, we can't do it all with our budget, but when there are people who are out on bikes, um, smarter with their smartphones and apps than I am, um, just willing to turn that on uh, and, and, and record that data and submit it uh, is, is extremely useful, and we're only just beginning to discover how, uh, how effective it can be. So thanks for doing that. Thank you, Councillor Trinoshenko, and now the, uh, the mother of Canada, Councillor Wilkinson. <laughs> Actually, I'm, not, I'm a mother of three kids, that's all. Um, have you seen the TAC map that the, the Transportation National Committee of Canada did? They, they wrote it every place with color, whether it was safe or not. And I was wondering, probably this TAC map, I'm sure, covers Canada as well, does it not? Is there a consistency between what they did, which was by writing them and telling them this is dangerous? They, it was done by actual, they went over every single route. Um, and... Uh, and what you've got from using this tool, because it would be a very good way of comparison the accuracy from a cyclist point of view. So we haven't done a totally uh, data-based comparison of the agreement between the two maps, but having a look at both of them, yes, there is, you can just see visually uh, that there is a lot of agreement between the categorization that they performed and that we performed. I'm sure that there probably will be some differences just because ours was not done in person, ours was done on the characteristics of the roadway. Uh, and so a lot of that was, it's not based on user experience boots on the ground necessarily, but it's, they are, they are singing in harmony. Uh, and so, so and would you be willing to make this presentation to them as well? Oh, I'd happily, get, yeah. Okay, I'll get them to get in touch with you. The other thing is, uh, one of the things I've been working on is trying to get um, uh, cycle parking areas for people who can cycle part, drive partway and then cycle, as you probably know about. Uh, these types of things would be handy to have if once we get it, I think we'll get some, 
if they're on the map, just to identify where these are. So is it possible to identify other things? Where we have the park and rides and we have bicycle facilities and things like this. It's the next step, I realize. But I think it would be really valuable to have that additional information on it. Yes, so absolutely. This is something that we have on our data group work plan, <laughs> is to put a, a, a bike parking app on that. So the location of bike stations is already known to some degree, but to really quantify that, the software itself is actually capable of identifying bike racks. It's a visual recognition software. It knows how to do that. So that'll help us locate bike parking. The City of Ottawa also posts a number of pieces of information, such as locations of repair stands. And all of that could be turned into an app to help people locate parking and know if it's covered or not, if there's security cameras, if it's lit, uh, all that sort of information is available. Because one of the issues I get with developers all the time doing commercial is, where are your bike racks? Or oh, they're there. That's only enough for four bikes. What if it's a family of six? I mean, there, there's a real problem with um, a recognition that people do want a bike, at least in the good weather, and some of it is for local trips, some of it's to get to work, there's a whole lot, series of things. Most of our people tend to use it more recreational. But the... Um, it is, I think, important, and they are looking for this, and they're having bike groups that go out every week and try new routes and things like this, so I'll get the people who do that to take a look at this, too. So this is on your website, I take it? Yes, this is on our website, so Bike Ottawa, so uh, Bike Ottawa .ca is on that, yeah, our website, and maps.bikeottawa.ca okay. for the maps specifically. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Leeper, for actually doing this. I think it's going to be very helpful for everybody, and uh, I think I'll let you know about it. Attack meeting. I think they kept one coming up. They do it every month. So. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Um, is there anyone else before Councillor Looper? Oh, uh, Councillor Moffat. Just a quick thanks. The, um, one of the issues with when we did Main Street was I had gone out and cycled along it with some folks that were upset that I was against it. And the reality is, when you look at the stress mapping, it's we looked at the road differently. I was perfectly comfortable on the road as was. And there are people that are looking for a different level of cycling. And when you when you have a map that creates those opportunities where whereas I might be have a different opinion as to how I feel in the traffic, others feel otherwise. So having the ability to to have a program that can send you in different directions based on your level of comfort on the street is a positive. And I think Applying that lens through some of our complete street process and also through the transportation master plan and the cycling, uh, the official cycling plan that we that we put together, I think this can really tie into that and can make our planning better as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor and Councillor Kakish. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair and uh, Scott. That was uh, Old Ottawa East Main, not Manitic Main that you were talking about. I said Main Street. <laughs> Good. Um, one, I've met with you guys on several occasions, and one of the things that I've raised with you was the recurring theme of missing links in the suburbs, which is a big issue for a lot of people that we hear from. And sometimes it takes one or two um, cycling advocates in the community that really advocate and work with us through those things and with city staff, uh, Robin Bennett and others that are there as well who have helped us with the uh, coordination of some of that. How have you found, ha have you... Um, seen any sort of progress over the last few years in terms of some of those missing links, specifically asking, um, you know, in areas like Finley Creek, Riverside South, or, or Barhaven. Um, I know there was a project that was recently completed as well in, uh, in uh, the wards of myself and Councillor Harder and Councillor Aglai uh, with the multi-use pathway, but are those missing links, are we putting enough money towards missing links, are we improving some of that connectivity to help encourage more and more people to uh, make those treks into the urban core. Yeah. Are we putting enough into missing links? Well, as, as, a, as a bicycling advocate, I have to, of course, answer that you can always do more. <laughs> but I will say I am very pleased that the city is recognizing that missing links are critical. And, and I'm constantly being surprised when I'm out on my bike and there's a new link that's been created. There's, there's always something happening. So I, I give a lot of credit to the city for recognizing that and working at that. Uh, of course, we'd like to see more and faster, but we're always seeing that when intersections and roads are getting rebuilt, that they're being rebuilt as complete streets and complete intersections, and that's going a long way to filling in those missing links. So I think a tool like this can help identify them and perhaps bring, them, bring some more attention to them, but overall we are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Dewey's. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Heather, and thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Heather, for uh, uh, the presentation. I just, uh, in, in rural area, we've been really struggling with uh, cyclists to make sure that they're safe, and I know that uh, in some rural community, like in Greeley, for instance, uh, the community has been working very hard, and now they created something called the Greeley Loop, and that connects all our uh, villages together, because as you know, Greeley was built uh, mostly by OMB and not by the city and uh, they, we didn't have, uh, no one followed the secondary plan or the CDP but, but uh, with the hard work of the community and also the work with our city staff we were able now to have a greedy loop and soon enough we'll be connected to the multi-use pathway with, because we're still missing a small link uh, and from there that this link is going to give us access to be able to go up to Osgood or down to Manatec with the new bike lane we just put on which owns. I know it's people talking about which owns is very uh, dangerous and it's very scary road, but uh, we've done a lot of work. We widened the road. We put a special uh, bike lane from uh, Dozwa almost all the way to uh, the Shoppers Drug Mart, then we can connect to Councillor's Moffat. So we're really working hard uh, on making sure those are these, you're going to be able to identify all these little uh, pockets in the communities, how we're going to connect them together to that map so we can give and working with our offices to make sure there is enough safety and making sure that we can promote these for you. Uh, yes, so absolutely. Our map captures the entire city of Ottawa region, uh, which, is a, which is a huge area. And as new infrastructure like the Greeley Loop opens, we update the map to reflect that. And a co-worker of mine actually lives in Greeley, and he told me about the Greeley Loop when it opened and what a, what a great initiative it was and how much he was enjoying it to be able to get out and get around the community and how much he was looking forward to having it connected to the Osgood Rail Trail. So uh, it's a job well done for Greeley, a great cooperative effort. Well, thank you. This is good, very good news. And if there is anything else you can reach out, we can uh, work with you. That will be, I'll be more than happy to promote that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Drews. Uh, if there's no one else, then uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Councillor Reaper. Thanks. Uh, Heather, just a couple of quick practical questions. Uh, how many, can you even begin to um, calculate how many volunteer hours were put into this initiative? I, I see, and we make, want to make sure that Matthew Darwin isn't uh, unrecognized here. Uh, I know he did a lot of work. Is it a couple of thousand volunteer hours, more? Well, in some ways, I want to say we were having so much fun we didn't keep track. <laughs> <laughs> Don't admit but, that. <laughs> but we do have a large group of volunteers. We all have different interests. And uh, so, for example, I had a big role in taking the photos and riding my bike doing that, and countless hours because I just really love doing it. So several hundred hours of, of photography, uh, and I would s expect uh, several tens of hours of programming, maybe into the... Hundreds. I, I, I wouldn't want. I, I wasn't involved too much on that end, but I know that Matthew and, and others uh, in the group were investing a lot of time in refining the algorithm, and, and they're still tweaking it. You know, just in terms of how do we deal with a, a road through a parking lot, for example? How do you classify that as a service road? But a service road is also parallel to a highway, and those are very different kinds of service roads. So we had to figure out those kinds of little puzzles to make the map as reflective as we could of the real conditions. But uh, I would estimate, this is, this is a real guess, let's say a thousand hours. A thousand hours. But, and um, um, I, I put uh, $7,500 of my office budget into that, so I'm feeling really comfortable with the return on investment uh, from that. Uh, I'm not sure that um, uh, you know, another way of doing this would have yielded the same kind of uh, same kind of results. You know, relying on those volunteers who are enthusiastic contributors uh, was a big uh, a big piece of it. And I would encourage uh, folks to take a look at the full report as well. Um, there are case studies in here about how can this tool be used to help uh, build better routes to schools, better routes to shopping centers, um, uh, better routes for various uh, different things. It's interesting. The um, I closed the block of uh, road in the ward to connect the uh, city park with the NCC park at Pontiac. Within a couple of days, maybe, that had been reflected on your map. Uh, what is the, the maintenance plan? Is this real time? Is it going to be continually updated? Yeah, the map is, is updated in, in live time, essentially. So I think, yeah, as you mentioned, when that road was closed, I think the update was happening before the, before the uh, media stories were out, basically. Uh, yeah. yeah, so our, our volunteers are really enthusiastic mappers, and uh, we try to keep 
updates uh, happening continuously. There's a big street mapping community here in Ottawa, probably one of the most active in Canada. Absolutely. And, and we take advantage of that, absolutely. So the, uh, you know, my, my final point on, on uh, what was done here was, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love all of us to encourage these kind of, as, as David called it, uh, citizen science or um, uh, crowdsourcing type of efforts uh, to be put into place. In the course of this term of council, um, I've put in place the I Bike I Buy app, which allows people uh, to uh, enter how much they, they purchase when they're shopping. Uh, some great crowdsourced data there. All the data is open. You can see uh, what kind of um, uh, purchases people are making, uh, even just during the, uh, the recent outage, inviting people to fill out, uh, to map where they had power and where they didn't uh, was, uh, was a success. Uh, we can leverage volunteers to create a lot of the data that we need to make uh, better policy choices, and we can do it for a lot less money to the taxpayer uh, by leveraging the very enthusiastic contributions that um, uh, residents are making. So I, I do appreciate the work you do on this. I encourage everyone to take a look at the, uh, the report that you furnished to me, and which is attached to, uh, to this item uh, for, for examples of how it can be used to make better policy. And uh, I thank you very much, Heather. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for that discussion. So can we receive this item? Receive. Receive. Now we're going to go to uh, Barhaven Light Rail Transit, baseline station to Barhaven Town Centre, planning and environmental assessment study, statement of work. Uh, Councillor Harder. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to uh, sit with you today and uh, to speak about this project, which, uh, as you know, uh, well, as you don't know, but as Councillor Deans and I would know, back in 2006 we were having a discussion that was very different. So it's, this is almost like back to the future. Thanks to the Mayor and Council for supporting the approval of funds to initiate the environmental assessment for this critical transportation link. As the study unfolds, it will reveal how desperate Barhaven is for transportation infrastructure both to and from Barhaven, but also within Barhaven. We need this high-quality LRT, but also other key cycling and pedestrian facilities, along with roads, intersections, and interchanges. Those who live, work, and play in Barhaven are all very excited to see this environmental assessment get underway. And as Barhaven continues to grow, we know that of all the city's growth, um, approximately one-third took place in Barhaven. Barhaven is now about 90,000 people, a large Ontario city. Major retailers like Costco, Canadian Tire, Walmart, and so many are all here serving the community. The headquarters for RCMP and Tomlinson have located here, and more are to come. There are in the order of 15,000 to 20,000 new homes that can be built in Barhaven in the existing urban boundary, 8,000 of which are expected in the town centre alone. And of course we have challenges. Transit and Southwest Transitway, first and foremost, I'm very happy that this study will dovetail with the Great Separations Environmental Assessment, a key um, priority for this city uh, through the work that we've done with VIA and uh, Transport Canada uh, to, um, to make Fallowfield Station safe as well as all the rail crossings, including the transitway and the, um, the road networks of Woodruff and Fallowfield. Between the Sportsplex and Baseline Station, bus-only lanes have worked well, but it's time to look at a fully grade-separated facility. The Barhaven BIA held a workshop to look at how the Barhaven Town Centre will develop over the next several years. If 50% of the peak hour trips use transit, and we believe that that is possible, that will be about 7,000 new riders in the mornings and afternoons on the LRT. Unfortunately, the study area stops at the Town Centre because there are thousands of new homes to be built on either side of New Green Bank Road that could benefit from the LRT. By the way, the existing 95 routes south of the Jock River are terrible in need fixing. And I want to thank personally Mr. Manconi and his team for doing what they are trying to do on a daily basis to help that out. With regard to cars, bikes, and pedestrians, note to city staff, and I thank you, Vivi, for the work you've done on this. When you dive into how much is going on in Barhaven, you're going to be shocked. And I know that you attended a meeting back in uh, February, late February, I think it was, and you took the opportunity to drive in the dark down Green Bank Road, and you were quite surprised. Even with LRT, we're still going to see big demands wanting to get across the Fallowfield screen line. Green Bank Road needs to be widened. When Strandhurst Drive opens, it will be over capacity. We need to find ways of using other roads like Moody Drive which is underused. 
it really needs to take some investment for sure to make it uh, navigable, but certainly it is an opportunity. Canada and Orleans all have three highway interchanges. Barhaven has one, and we can't get to it. We need another one at Barnesdale, and Councillor Moffat and I have been working on that, and, and uh, as is uh, MPP Lisa McLeod. When these projects are designed, it will be an opportunity to improve the cycling and pedestrian networks throughout Barhaven. Funding in the Transportation Master Plan and the Official Plan, through that, the D.C. bylaw has money for Strandherd, Green Bank, Prince of Wales, and Jockville. That's good, but we need more funds for LRT, Green Bank Road through the Greenbelt and the Barnesdale Interchange. When we start updating the OP and the TMP, this LRT, along with other transportation infrastructure, will need to be included. So thanks to all of you for your time, and if I can speak for all of Barhaven, and my part of Barhaven anyway, the entire community is looking forward to studying um, and working with the city on this important study. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. I'm uh, just going to jump in very briefly here and interrupt the meeting shortly. Um, I've got to run back down to a tornado relief um, uh, meeting, uh, but I just want to take this opportunity as the chair of this committee. First of all, I want to thank the vice chair for jumping in at the very last second and, and doing a wonderful job according to Twitter. Um, so, um, but I just I just wanted to I just want to thank uh, each and every one of the of the committee members uh, over the last four years. I think we've done some some amazing work. We've made a lot of progress on the LRT file. We've made a lot of progress on cycling made a lot of progress on moving towards a, a Vision Zero approach for the city. We have a lot of work to do uh, going into next term. We have the introduction of photo radar. We have the big report coming back on, on Vision Zero and what principles can be applied uh, in, the, uh, in the city. But again, I would be remiss if I hadn't run out of this meet that meeting to come to this meeting to, to, to say thank you to all uh, of you who have come out, done good hard work on these files, and uh, represent your constituents and all of the city very ably uh, on all these very difficult transportation files and snow files and asphalt files and everything else that falls under this committee. So uh, again, I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to the Vice Chair. But again, thank you so much. And this goes without saying, this is the last meeting uh, of this committee for this term. There will not be one in November. Lucky. And uh, thank you for letting me interrupt you there for a minute, Councilor Harder. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Councilor McKinney. But again, very much thanks to all of you. I scared him. I said I had a motion on the floor to introduce a Vision Zero policy today. I was going to vote on it. He wasn't, he wasn't going to leave again. Um, thank you for that, Councillor Harder. Are there any questions to staff on, uh, on the IPD? No. Councillor Kakish. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And, uh, more of a question. I know we're looking at basically electrifying the Southwest Transit Way, and I can tell you, obviously, having just under half a bar, even in my ward, there's not a single person who doesn't um, raise this uh, issue, obviously, because uh, many obviously feel uh, that they got the short end of the stick from the cancellation of North-South. Um, and we've talked about this, Vivi, many times over the last four years with regards to having that loop and protecting the east-west connectivity from Riverside South and the corridor there. So what, what, where is that and why is that not part of the, the assessment uh, that we're going to be doing? Through, um, through you, Chair. Th that is still in a transportation master plan. We have our corridor protected. Um, it is a, a BRT connection rather than an LRT connection, and so it's a, an issue of prioritizing. So this is, and it requires funding for implementation. But the fis facility, the corridor, everything has been identified. So that's the next step is um, going through what is the next stage in our rapid transit uh, in terms of funding for, um, for implementation. So why wouldn't we, as part of the scope of this environmental assessment, though, also look at that east West Corridor to ultimately one day also connect the original plan um, over from Riverside South to Barhaven as part of this. Is it, does it complicate it, the terms of reference for the environmental assessment? Why can't we throw that in there? Um, because, Councillor, uh, the transportation, the, the Barhaven LRT is identified in the ultimate network. The connection between Barhaven uh, Town Centre and Riverside South is identified in the TMP 
in the ultimate network as well as a BRT connection. So why would they do that if they're both in the ultimate plans beyond? Because the work has already been done for that corridor. Okay. But we have protected it. We've done it through many studies, the original north-south LRT, and later on we did what was called the BRRT, the Barhaven Riverside Rapid Transit Facility. So it's been studied already. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the ultimate solution, obviously, is that original one, and we do have that east-west connectivity. I don't know when that's going to happen, but that's certainly, you know, we've had this discussion. I know we protected the transit corridor, obviously, in the recent updates of the Riverside South Community Design Plan. And ultimately, you know, I think that's the dream for everyone there, and many people who moved there, obviously, that expected the trains to be running there now. So, you know, obviously, many people in Barhaven want the train there, but I think the ultimate solution, as well as having that east-west connectivity that was originally envisioned when those communities were built and developed, and as a result of that cancellation, I think many of the residents and constituents are suffering traffic-wise as a result of that. So I think that should be our ultimate vision and our ultimate goal, and that's going to be the most efficient and effective way of fixing the ridership and the reliability issues there. So thank you, Vivian, for all the work that you've done and discussions we've had in my office on this file as well, and to Mr. Manconi and to the Mayor's office as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kakish. Councillor Chernyshenko. Thank you. I'll blame it on the Chair that this is kind of an end-of-term type of comment. He started it, so I'll try not to go too long on this. I think this is a – I'll talk specifically to this, but then a bit of a bigger picture here. This is a very interesting example of where it is a very specific issue. We're trying to get the opportunity for people in a big and growing part of the city that's far away from the center, the ways in which to move about that aren't as car dependent. And then speaking as a councillor in the core of the ward, not to have to become the cars moving through our neighborhood, potentially disrupting or polluting or causing noise to residential communities that might be doing what they need to do in a cleaner, quieter, more efficient way. And what exactly the best route is for this, how to go about building it, that I can't prejudge. That's what the purpose of an EA is here. I certainly – excuse me – I certainly know the value of doing the EAs as soon as we can because that's how you get your project shovel ready. That was certainly the benefit for me with a project I was so passionate about that's now been named the Flora Footbridge, where having that shovel ready when infrastructure money became available was absolutely critical because it was, ta-da, here we are, thanks for the money. Not quite as simple as that, but it's important when we know these projects are key to our network to get them ready for funding because we all know it can't be funded purely on the municipal tax base. So finally, I think my point is just in terms of – this is a message, I guess, for us, for everyone seeking a position on council. It's a reminder that we are a big city that is amalgamated, and some people may still want to fight the old battle of amalgamation. Goodness knows in central wards we often hear downsides of amalgamation, but you can't do good transportation planning in sections by ward, by areas of the city. Good transportation planning is region-wide, and I certainly am pleased to play my part in bringing good transit. Yes, sure, there's a self-interest as well, but in bringing good transit out to other parts of the city. And so I think this is an example of being ready for that next stage. Some might say it should have been done earlier. We know the history behind that, but I'm pleased to support moving forward on this. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. If I don't see any other questions, receive the IPD. Receive. Receive. So now we'll go back. Thank you, Councillor Harder. Now we're going to go back to the first item held. That was – sorry, it's number – oh, here we are. Status update. Councillor Flurry had two questions for public work staff on parking. I see Scott Caldwell is here. 
Yes, uh, Mr. Madam President, uh, the, um, the situation is that we've highlighted to staff uh, and I've asked staff to review uh, different models in terms of parking authority. I believe that that uh, is, should be in line with our governance uh, review of council because it's a significant uh, decision and discussion. And right now I'm seeing uh, the proposed IPD time frame missing that window. So I wonder if we can uh, review and, and give a direction to staff to ensure that it's uh, in line with our governance uh, period. Does staff want to respond to that? Chair, sure. um, we are currently underway with a, a, a refresh of our municipal park management strategy. Uh, we are first and foremost looking at the uh, strategy as a whole to ensure that it's current and uh, it was originally uh, approved by council in 2009, so some time has, uh, has passed. Um, following that, and we've, we've done some great work and there's been some consultations fed into that to this point, but there's still some work left to do and some broader consultation to occur. Uh, following from that, we will be, once we set our mandate and confirm that, we will be undertaking in the governance review as well as the development of a bike parking strategy and all that is intended to roll together. Um, and the date that we have provided to this point is, is uh, September 2019 in order to ensure and allow for the, uh, an appropriate amount of uh, consultation to feed into that process. So I, I'm looking to the clerk's office. Uh, could you remind us when the new term governance will be in terms of period? Um. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, it's anticipated that the term of council governance review would be tabled at the last meeting of this term of council at the end of November and considered at the first meeting of the new term of council uh, the first week of December. So I don't know how staff comment and committee's objective, because this is something we've talked about at committee now uh, well over this term. Of not, it's not about a parking review, it's about a, the way we can uh, structure parking and, and bring a, a new model can be done. So I think there's uh, the review that staff are undertaking relates to existing operations and sure we'll consider uh, other models. But I think from a committee standpoint, there's no better time to do so than, than governance. So I'm wondering if we can get uh, clarity from the clerks as to procedurally how do we get that uh, integrated in the governance period. Um, Madam Vice Chair, um, I'll defer to uh, Public Works and Environmental Services staff as to whether they in fact have the resources and time required in the next two months to in fact provide that information in accordance with the timelines of governance. Um, uh, it does not sound to me like they do at this stage. Um, committee would be able to give direction to provide an update in accordance with that timeline, but uh, it would depend well, on whether staff can actually accommodate the work required to uh, so do this the, governance review. Just to call the, the reality is this committee and the council I am the new to early in the new term will need to make a strategic direction as to how do we want parking to be managed in the city. And the challenge is if we let staff do all of their work, we have no, we're not giving a direction as to the model that council wishes to embark in. So in my mind, it's less so of the operational work that, that, that staff would have to do. It's about this committee and council setting a direction. And I'm, by, by the timeline that's provided, we are way too advanced, we would be way too advanced in the new term to see a result and a shift in another term, which brings us back to this, this initially came up in, the, in my first term, which was before 2014. Staff carried through and said, yeah, in 2014, between 2014 and 2018, we're going to review it. Now we find ourselves pushed into the, almost the midpoint of the next term. It's, this is like six years more than what was ever anticipated. So how can this committee put its weight into a direction uh, relating to, to the governance of, of a parking authority? Madam Vice Chair, uh, I would be happy to take... Uh, can, I, can I do a direction? Can we do a direction? Or do we need a motion? Do we need... Um, 
It would be appropriate. I'd be happy to take his direction back to the city clerk and solicitor and Mr. Caldwell back to the general manager, a direction to review what scope of information could be provided to members of council with the governance report. At this time, I'm not aware of the scope of work that has been done and would be required and whether that is achievable in that timeline. Right, but I believe that the scope of work is walking us through this channel of 2019, which I actually don't believe is needed. I think there are best practices across the country and even in Ontario settings that we could just rely on and proceed. So I'm fine with what you're saying. I just, this is more of a committee power versus the bureaucracy timelines. Like, I think if committee sets the tone as to what the objectives is, then great, go and implement it. Right, I think now it's feeling the other way around where staff are going to come with a final accomplished product, which is too late in the term. So I wonder if we can just tweak the direction and ensuring that as part of governance, council set an objective relating to parking authority. So if I have, if I understand you correctly, what you want to ensure is that as we're looking at governance, we're considering or we're saying consider all models. Think through what we're doing around parking and all models. At the same time, what you don't want to do is wait until 2019 for a report to come back to say this is what's recommended and we've not looked at other models for parking. Is that correct? Correct. I want an implementation of a new model ahead of the end of term of the next council. So if we backtrack, we need to give clear direction early on so that that work can be implemented. I'm not sure that we can give direction for an implementation of a new model, but can we give direction for staff to consider through governance and when we get our governance report through direction to say, you know, consider all options available so that it leaves it open for 2019? Sorry, Chair, just to clarify, actually to back up maybe to clarify, the process that we are working through right now is to update the strategy and update our mandate so that when it comes time to undertake our governance review, we're considering all options and that has always been what was anticipated, but we're going to evaluate those options based on our confirmed mandate that we're trying to establish in the process that we're walking through right now rather than picking a governance model and then finalize or firm up an update, what our objectives are and what the parking strategy mandate is. Yeah, I want the memo back before next council on the issue because we're walking down the rabbit hole here. If we go and have a new model, the new model will have to set out a new mandate which will come back to council anyway. So no offense, Scott, but I don't agree that we should do the mandate. I think the mandate walks us through a very, it's like it sets us up for an outcome that we, like why don't we look at the model, is this the way we want the delivery of the program and then establish what the mandate would be around that. So a memo back before the next council on what that would look like going into governance, is that doable? Madam Vice Chair, generally the council approved motions and inquiries and directions process provides that where a direction or inquiry cannot be undertaken within existing resources within a reasonable amount of time, council would require a motion to direct that work. So at this point in time, we need to indeed review that with the department and the time frames in which they can undertake it and if so direct, we can absolutely undertake to provide information before council next week on the scope of that. Okay. Can we get a scope of the framework and the work plan and then council can decide with its open eyes on it. Does that work? Yes. Okay. So do we need a direction or is that the direction? If we could, Kelly can assess in writing that out, but yes, we can take that as direction. Yeah, we'll get that. Okay. Thank you.
And there's the second one, Madam Chair, which is, it's a simpler one. It's just, we need a timeline for the implementation of the snow um, operation review so that the, the subsequent step can follow. So right now in the, uh, in the um, sorry, the title there of the, uh, the program is the, uh, that item on the agenda is uh, the status update. So uh, the, the status update on, uh, it just sets no timeline. So I'd love a head of council to clarify what is the timeline for the implementation of that snow uh, review so that we can actually uh, move to other things. Because right now it's, a, it's an open-ended uh, response by staff. That's fair enough. We can give that direction. So with that, uh, Carrie, status update. Excellent. Uh, notices of motion for consideration of the subsequent meeting. No. In inquiries? I have two. And I have one. Okay. Go ahead. You said it first. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Public Transit Infrastructure Fund, or PTIF, was used to accelerate and support the city's investments in the O-Train Confederation Line in Stage 2 LRT and in citywide cycling and pedestrian initiatives with the goal of enhancing connectivity to our transit system. As part of this fund, a portion of the sidewalks on Southgate Road were rehabilitated to better uh, connect residents to nearby transit stops. Unfortunately, the sidewalk rehab have ended mid-block, and residents on Southgate Road are disappointed that half the street sidewalks remain in poor condition. It seems unreasonable that staff did not have the flexibility to expand the scope of the project to include the, include the one block of remaining sidewalk. In order to avoid this in future, can staff please review the policy used when planning PTIF projects or similar programs to ensure that we are using a common sense approach for sidewalk rehabilitation? projects. Thank you, Chair Deans. Uh, or Councillor Deans, sorry, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two uh, uh, inquiries. The uh, first one is understanding that some of the city sidewalks have higher traffic volumes than the roads they are uh, beside. Could staff review the options for improving snow clearing on the busier sidewalks, including a vis uh, feasibility of implementing a pilot project? Specifically, uh, you know, I could give an example of Cumberland Street or Somerset Street near the University of Ottawa campus. And uh, my second inquiry is, can the general manager of planning, infrastructure, and economic development review new and planned infrastructure project with coordination of new utility installations? specifically the new road project on Marie uh, and TELUS new installations to determine what can the city do better to coordinate planned infrastructure project in the same physical area uh, to protect the integrity of the new city infrastructure projects, prevent new infrastructure from being damaged, and ensuring that if utility companies damage new infrastructure, that they repave a broader section to ensure value and integrity of city's investments. Thank you, and uh, I have one as well. Um, I'd like Transportation Services staff to report back on strategies that can be used in the downtown core where it is cons consistently shown that drivers are blocking private driveways. Uh, what can be done in terms of signage and pavement markings to deter drivers from doing this? What are the best practices in other cities to discourage blocking of driveways? And has the city uh, looked at increasing the fine for parking and blocking uh, driveway, which is uh, currently set at $70. Any other inquiries? No? Other business? No? Adjournment. It's been a pleasure being your chair for an hour.